I am here with Bart Ehrman. Bart, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. So you have a fascinating new book, The Triumph of Christianity, How Forbidden Religion Swept the World, which we will definitely talk about, I want to talk about, but it, is, it is, comes on the back of, of many books you've written about Christianity. And you have a, a very interesting story with respect to your own faith and scholarship. So I just want to start there, which is not really the, the subject of your current book. For those listeners who don't know you, take us back to some of the crucial moments in your development as a thinker on this topic. What, what, what is your background religiously, and where did you, you wander on the landscape of faith and doubt? Yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a bit of an odd duck in the field of uh, New Testament and early Christian studies uh, because I'm a, I'm a scholar of the New Testament. My PhD is in New Testament, but I'm actually uh, not a Christian myself, and there aren't very many non-Christian uh, scholars of the New Testament out there. I was raised Christian, though. Um, I was raised in the, uh, when I was a kid. I was in the Episcopal Church and uh, grew up uh, fairly religious. Uh, when I was in high school— I had a born-again experience, and mm -hmm. uh, I committed my life to Christ, and uh, that's how I got really interested in the Bibles, because I was religiously committed. Tell me more about that. What, what is a born-again experience? We're going to talk about Saul and the road to Damascus that made him Paul, but what was your experience? So I, I was a church-going Episcopalian. And I started in high school attending a youth group that was uh, not connected with the church, but was a very religious uh, youth group. It was called uh, Campus Life Youth for Christ. And the leader of this group was a 20-something guy who was very charismatic in his personality, who insisted that if you, uh, that the only way to be a real Christian was to ask Jesus into your heart and to commit your life to him as your Lord and Savior. Uh, and so uh, I decided I had to become a Christian. <laughs> it wasn't clear to me what I was before that, uh, because I, you know, I went to church every week. Uh, but... Um, this was a sort of a personal commitment that somebody would make, and so being born again meant making this commitment, and then you were given a new life. Your old life was over, and now you began your life as a Christian. But was it merely a matter of deciding to do this? Did it entail some experience that, that seemed confirmatory of the belief structure? I mean, was there was some, some evidence that came crashing down subjectively that seemed to verify the, the truth of the doctrine? Yeah. So the way it worked and still works in these circles is that it involves uh, saying a prayer and uh, making a personal profession to God of faith in Christ. And the confirmation is in a kind of feeling of elation, where you, uh, you have this kind of psychological moment of uh, heightened emotion. And uh, this is, uh, that is sort of the beginning confirmation that something's actually happened, and you're a, you're a different person now. And so uh, as a 15-year-old, uh, having only been born 15 years earlier, I was born again. <laughs> hmm. Well, the liability here is at the level of epistemology is, is hard to ignore because what sort of group induction experience as a teenager wouldn't produce a feeling of elation? I mean, you could imagine so many other things being swapped in for Christianity there. Did you worry about this at the time, or was it just, was the truth of the beliefs that you were taking on just kind of baked into you based on your background? Yeah, no, I was. I didn't worry about it a bit for many years. Uh, I was convinced that I knew the truth, and that uh, if somebody wanted to have eternal life, they had to also know this truth. And there was one truth, and uh, and it was rooted very much in uh, an understanding of the Bible, that the Bible was the revelation from God, and one had to uh, commit oneself to the truth of the Bible in order uh, both to know God and to have eternal life. And anyone who didn't uh, accept this message was destined to uh, the fires of hell forever. So you would have called yourself an evangelical at that point? Does anyone call themselves a fundamentalist, or is that a word of opprobrium spoken by secularists who, who don't agree with them? 
Well, not just secularists. Uh, fundamentalism tends to be a, the term be used for uh, the guy who's to the far right of you. <laughs> right, and so right. uh, even in Christian circles, you, you have a lot of Christians who talk about fundamentalists, and they, what they mean by that often is uh, somebody who's uh, sort of rabidly conservative. But I, I'll say, I mean, when I went off to uh, college, I went to a fundamentalist Bible college, and we we were somewhat proud of the term fundamentalist because for us, it meant that we subscribed to the very fundamentals of the faith. Right. And, and there were other Christians who were more liberal in their orientation, who didn't accept even the very fundamentals. And so we considered ourselves to be fundamentalists in what we thought was a positive sense, that, that we held to the, the essential elements of the Christian faith. Yeah. I mean, wasn't it originally a coinage of, of Moody Bible College? Um, no, I'm not sure where it originally started, it, it, but I think it actually started later than Moody started. Moody started in the in the late 19th century, and the the term fundamentalist became a big deal in the ni- 1920s when mm. there was a split in several denominations uh, over um, issues such as you know was there a literal virgin birth uh, or is the Bible inerrant in all of its wording or not with conservatives saying, yes, it's inerrant, and yes, there was a literal virgin birth, and other Christians saying, no, not so much. And so it divided into fundamentalists and liberals. Okay, so take me forward from there. So you're, you're 15, you're now a fundamentalist Christian. You believe, presumably, a whole raft of doctrines, and now you're becoming, at some point, more of a formal student of the faith. What, what did your, your academic background begin to look like? So in high school, I was very active on the uh, high school debate team, uh, and I was uh, very involved in debate. And when I was graduating from high school, I had to decide whether I'd go on to Kansas University to be on the debate team or to go off to a Christian school and further my understanding of the Bible. And I ended up uh, following the latter path. Uh, This 20-something fellow who was the head of this youth group had gone to Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. Um, and told me that if I was going to be a serious Christian, I too would go to Moody Bible Institute. Mm-hmm. And so I did. <laughs> I went to Moody Bible Institute, which was a, it was a three-year uh, degree program uh, that focused on Bible and theology. And there, I, my, my classes, my initial post-high school education was taking uh, classes. One semester, I'd have a class on the Gospel of John, and then another on the Book of Hebrews, and uh, another on uh, how to evangelize the pagans, <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. it was all it was all Christian kind of stuff, and I so I did that, that always for comes three in years. handy. So, did you start with the study of the the relevant ancient languages at that point? No, uh, when I was at Moody, I wanted to take all the Bible and theology classes I could, and I, even though I knew the importance of learning Greek for the New Testament, I I didn't want to waste time doing that because I just wanted to master the uh, the Bible as well as I could, and so I took all my classes in on the English text. Uh, uh, but you know, my my first semester at Moody, I took a class on the Gospel of John, so the entire semester on this one book of the New Testament, and. During this class, there was, the guy who was teaching this class was seemed really smart to me. He was really organized, and, and I thought, you know, this guy's getting paid to do that. I, I want to do that. And so mm. already as a 17-year-old, I decided I wanted to become a New Testament scholar. So then you just you went to graduate school, still full of faith? When, when did your study begin to erode your conviction in the, in the truth of the doctrine? Right. So, the, so Moody was a three-year institution. And to, to get a, the bachelor's degree, you had to transfer somewhere else to get credits. And so I transferred to, after Moody, I went to Wheaton College, which is uh, Billy Graham's alma mater. Mm. And uh, for me, that was a step towards liberalism, <laughs> because <laughs> they were not quite as fundamentalist as I was used to. That and at, funny. at Wheaton, I took a, uh, for my foreign language requirement, I took Greek, ancient Greek. And it turned out I was uh, pretty good at it. And so then I decided I wanted to do my graduate work uh, dealing with the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, uh, studying the New Testament in the original Greek language. And the world expert on the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament was a man named Bruce Metzger, who taught at Princeton Theological Seminary. And so when I graduated from Wheaton with a degree in English, uh, I went off to uh, Princeton Theological Seminary to uh, further my education in Greek manuscripts. And then. Did that take you through your PhD? Or? 
So I did a master's degree there, a three-year master's degree, and then I then I uh, applied and got into the PhD program, and uh, so it was another four years getting my my PhD. And uh, in the process, my my first year in my master's program, I took Hebrew so I could read um, the Old Testament in the original Hebrew, and uh, I learned German so I could read what scholars in Germany had said, and French so I could read what scholars in France had said, and and so I start I, I started getting involved in serious scholarship, as opposed to uh, simply memorizing the Bible or uh, you know learning about the Bible. I learned I was I was actually studying it in the original language and. And that was largely what led me away from fundamentalist Christianity. Well, so before we talk about the epiphanies you had that led you to doubt, or the various stages of doubt, take me back to before that moment. And at that time, if we had met you at your most educated with respect to the Bible, but also full of faith, at that point, what would the the young Bart Ehrman have said is the most convincing argument in favor of Christianity? Um, I would have said that historians can prove that Jesus was raised from the dead, and uh, mm. that there's no explanation for uh, the evidence other than an actual resurrection, which means that uh, God must have raised Jesus and that that proved the, uh, proved the uh, historical reliability of the Christian claims. And what would you have said the evidence was, given that there's no doubt that most historians would balk at any challenge to prove the, the resurrection? So what, how would a historian go about doing that? So again, so this is back in my very conservative day, Christian days. I, I would have said that there are two uh, basic um, historical facts that virtually everybody agrees on, and people need to explain these two facts. The two facts are that uh, three days after Jesus was put in a tomb, the tomb was empty, and mm -hmm. that some of his followers said they saw him alive again afterward, and that any explanation for those two facts has to explain both of them satisfactorily. And, uh, and then what I would do is I would go, by, go through various explanations for why there would be an empty tomb and why people would say they saw him alive afterward, uh, including groups of people. And I would say that, um, that none of the naturalist explanations simply work for, for, those, uh, for those phenomena. Well, so as a skeptic here, uh, some explanations just come rushing in for me, as you might imagine. And so I'm just wondering why, and I'm not, I guess I'm not speaking about you personally here, but just as a matter of culture, the, the, the culture of people like you who are very well versed in the Bible, who believe the central doctrines of Christianity and anchor their belief to this claim. I mean, so here's the the first thing that, as a you know, an atheist debater on this topic, would come to mind to say. I mean, there's, there's obviously there's Hume's famous line that about there being you know no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless that testimony is of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which its I think his word is endeavors to establish. So, again, translating that into modern English, the testimony about the miracle. It would have to be even an even greater miracle for that testimony to be false, and that bar is almost never cleared. I mean, like you can think of an uncountable number of modern situations where you have Western devotees of Indian gurus who believe that their teacher has performed a miracle, and the culture of confirmation bias and self-deception is just palpable when you when you talk to these people. I mean, you're surrounded by people who, even in a modern context where they have all of the resources of scientific skepticism at their disposal, and when they haven't been indoctrinated into these beliefs since birth, you can still find Ivy League-educated people who are convinced of the veracity of various miracles really on the basis of hearsay. I mean, they're, really, they're not disposed to put these claims to any kind of empirical or logical test, and certainly they're not meeting Hume's criterion here that the, the testimony of these people, the people who are delivering the hearsay, is somehow so rock solid that 
it would be an even greater miracle that you'd have to admit if you were to suspect that it's false. How is it that you account for what seems, at least from the outside, to be such a, a disinclination to put these claims to some obvious skeptical tests? Right. I'm, I mean, I completely agree with your view on this now. And I have debates with people today, uh, uh, public debates with people who want to argue that resurrection really happened. And it's incredible to me that they continue to think that you can prove this. But, you know, as you as you know, from your debates, people who are inside a particular tradition evaluate probability differently from people who are outside that tradition. And so the Christians, uh, people who, like me, were fundamentalists, what we would argue at the time was uh, a couple things. One is that the, the disciples absolutely thought they saw Jesus raised from the dead. They talked with him. They ate with him. They uh, spent time with him after his crucifixion. Uh, and the reason we know that they really did is because they all uh, were willing to be martyred for this belief that he'd been raised, and, and that, that for us was evidence that it happened. But not only that, but we're not just talking about individual things where you could say that somebody had a dream or a hallucination. Uh, we have uh, authors claiming that 500 people saw him at the same time. So uh, it couldn't be a hallucination because there, I mean, you can't have a group hallucination of 500 people. So this was, these, these are the kind of arguments we have. And these arguments made real sense to people who already believed in the resurrection because it just seemed plausible. Uh, mm. And to outsiders, of course, it just seems kind of crazy. But to insiders, uh, you know, you're, for, all, for everything with the past, you're trying to evaluate what probably happened and there's no reason it probably didn't happen. And so, well, okay, it seems like it probably did happen. <laughs> yeah, well, so, so the other issue here, which comes ready to hand, is the time at which these various Gospels were composed. Perhaps you can remind me of the history here. None of these documents that are ostensibly reporting these eyewitness accounts of miracles were actually contemporaneous with the miracles or with the, with the ministry of Jesus, what is the earliest account we have of anything that Jesus is reported to have said or, or done? Right. So, yeah, so the basic dating is that Jesus died around the year 30 of the Common Era. Um, our earliest gospel is probably the Gospel of Mark, which was written around the year 70 of the Common Era, so it's 40 mm. years later. This is a kind of contemporary view of, of critical scholars. Uh, Matthew and Luke would have been later than that, maybe 80 to 85 of the Common Era, John maybe 90 or 95. So we're talking 65 years later for the Gospel of John. And so when, when, I, was a, when mm. I was a fundamentalist Christian, though, I didn't accept those dates. I thought that uh, Matthew and John were written by people who were actually disciples of Jesus, and Mark and Luke were written by people who knew uh, eyewitnesses. And moreover, um, I would point out at the time that even prior to the Gospels, the Apostle Paul was writing, and Paul, Paul uh, wasn't one of Jesus' disciples, but Paul claims that he himself saw Jesus alive uh, soon after his death, well, within a couple years of his death. And Paul mm. tells us that uh, he knew 500 people who had seen Jesus at one time. And so... Uh, you know, uh, today, critical scholars would say, look, we don't have these accounts until decades later, uh, which I think is right. Uh, but when I was a fundamentalist, I, I would try to kind of argue back closer to the time of Jesus that we actually have people who said they knew eyewitnesses. And is that standard among fundamentalists, however well-educated in the, in the text, that they, they would not agree with the the modern academic dating. That's right, because dating. so the deal with the modern academic dating is the Gospel of Mark uh, seems to uh, seems to know that the temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Romans. Uh, that happened in the year seventy, mm. and uh, so probably it's written sometime after the fact. But fundamentalist Christians would say, uh, no, he's it's predicting it's going to happen. And so, you know, it could have happened, it happened well before, the, this gospel is well before that. And if you don't agree with that, it's because you have an anti-supernaturalist bias. <laughs> hmm. Oh, interesting. So, so they get a kind of a, an added benefit there. They not only get the contemporaneous record, they get the truth of prophecy. That's right. Interesting. It's good to 
focus on what, why all of this is important. There's a lot riding on this because the resurrection of Jesus is really the core miracle that I guess I should just ask you, what do you think or what, what is the, is, is there a standard conception of the, the minimal set of beliefs that makes a person a Christian? I understand that the, the fundamentalists would draw the line differently than others, but it's, I'm just reminded of the line from, I think it's First Corinthians from Paul, where he says, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, which is to say completely ineffectual, you know, in error. So there is no Christianity. On Paul's account, there is no Christianity unless the miracle of the resurrection is true. At least that's how I read that line. Is that the center of the, the center of the doctrine for most Christians or, or certainly anyone who wouldn't be, whose Christianity wouldn't have evaporated to a point where it really has no supernatural characteristic? Yeah, so, so the reality on the ground is that there, there is a bottom line for what one has to believe in order to be a Christian, and every Christian draws that bottom line in different places, and every Christian thinks that they're the only ones who have the right line. <laughs> mm-hmm. so, so yes, there are, there are lots of Christians who would say, if you don't believe in a literal resurrection of Jesus, then you really aren't a Christian, whatever else you might say. And they would, they would quote that line from Paul from 1 Corinthians 15 that you were quoting just now. Um, I know lots and lots of Christians who don't believe in a literal resurrection of Jesus. Um, They think that his body stayed in the grave, rotted in the grave, and that the resurrection is more of a spiritual event or it's a metaphorical event, but they still consider themselves Christian. I mean, there there are lots of very highly educated Christians who are sophisticated. Mm. Um, the, The more evangelical Christians would say, well, you're not really a Christian. And the other Christians would say, well, actually, you know, you're not, you're not the ones who's been given the right to define what a Christian is. Uh, and so there are these very large debates within, within Christianity itself about you know, where, where the bottom line is. Yeah, and I must say, I have met very sophisticated people, you know, very well-educated people, very successful people who are believing Christians. And when pressed on this point, I have been astonished to discover that they actually believe the literal uh-huh. story yeah. of, of resurrection. Yeah. I mean, these are, and these are not people who yeah. I would have thought were Bible thumpers or, or fundamentalists yeah. of any sort. This is like the last trench that has to be defended in the war against yeah. doubt. No, there certainly are a lot of people like that who are otherwise, I mean, who believe in evolution or believe in, I mean, they believe, you know, they believe in science. I mean, they, you know, they think the universe is 13.8 billion years old and whatever, but they would draw the line at a, at a literal resurrection. And there are a lot of other people, not, not as many, but there are uh, sophisticated uh, Christian thinkers who say, no, that uh, it's not a literal resurrection, and that, in fact, the earliest Christians didn't believe in a literal resurrection, that that was a later imposition on the faith. Hmm. Let's talk about a few other doctrinal claims that, that may or may not be central. So what is the place of heaven and hell would you say, in Christianity generally and and your version when you were a believer in particular? Yeah, so this is something I'm very interested in because it's what my next book is on. <laughs> mm. It's where the question of heaven and hell, where, where the issue of heaven and hell came from, because, uh, you know, the, the, the standard Christian belief um, uh, is that you, when a person dies, their soul goes to heaven or hell, goes for eternal reward or eternal punishment. And uh, that teaching's not in the Old Testament, and it's not what the historical Jesus thought. And so, where'd it come from? <laughs> and so, that's that, that's what my next book is. Uh, when I was a when I was a fundamentalist Christian, I was a fervent believer in uh, a literal heaven and a literal hell, and I believed that hell was uh, a place of eternal torment, uh, that it would never end, uh, with no possibility of escape. And it was the destination of the vast majority of the human race. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I mean, fancy that the kind of arrogance you know involved mm-hmm. with that kind of claim. You know that I'm I'm going to be rewarded forever, but my next door neighbor, well, poor sap, he's going to hell forever. That's uh, mm-hmm. the arrogance of it. I don't think uh, actually struck me at the time. And were, were you actually psychologically affected by it? I mean, presumably you you knew people who you recognized to be good people who you had nice connections with, but 
who you were sure were going to spend eternity in fire, was that belief deep enough so as to cause you any feeling of, of psychological pain or compassion? Or I mean, how, did you, how did you feel interacting with people who you knew were, were destined to be tortured for eternity? Yeah, no, it, it absolutely did have an effect. And uh, where it was practically manifest was in my desire to convert people. Uh, because mm -hmm. I believed that uh, goodness had nothing to do with it. It didn't matter whether you were a good person or a rotten person. If you didn't believe in Christ for your salvation, you were destined for hell. And so this is what, uh, this is what drove my uh, attempt to try and convert people, just as in early Christianity, it was this belief that drove the evangelism of the early church. Uh, so it's always been this kind of motivation for Christians that you know, if you really love somebody and you know they're going to hell, you, you need to sort of crack the whip and make them convert. There certainly are scriptural justifications for that belief. Now we're up against the limits of my Bible scholarship, but I seem to remember many passages where it's suggested either directly in the words of Jesus himself or at least by one of the, the gospel writers that, that there is no path to the, the Father, but through the Son, right? That's right. That's, that's the emphatic teaching of the Gospel of John, and that everybody who doesn't believe in, uh, in Christ is, is going to be condemned. Uh, but in the Gospels, um, it's not clear that this is eternal torment in a particular place. The idea of eternal torment is, uh, comes more clearly in the book of Revelation at the mm -hmm. end of the New Testament, where uh, where those who are opposed to God are thrown into a lake of fire, uh, and they, they burn in this, this lake of fire forever. I seem to remember that Jesus is, is presiding over that lake of fire. Well, so, the, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, it's actually, part of the intrigue of the book of Revelation is, is how intricate the scenario is, uh, which is, I think, one of the reasons people have been so drawn to it over the years, because it isn't just kind of a straightforward statement. It's actually this this graphic narrative portrayal and and trying to piece it all together because you've got you know you've got Christ and you've got God and you've got the angels and you've got you've got the Antichrist and the prophet of the Antichrist and so you have this entire scenario going on. Uh, but mm. but yeah, Christ and his followers are given an eternal reward in the New Jerusalem, and all those opposed to Christ are sent to the lake of fire. So if one were going to read the Bible, both Old and New Testament, straight through and form on the assumption that everything there is true and inerrant and that it's sort of on the reader to resolve any apparent contradictions, what rational understanding and expectation of the afterlife would one form? And so this is now a picture of the end times and, and, and one's personal end, you know, after death and I guess after the resurrection. And this is now sort of uncontaminated by the rest of the literature that has grown up on this. So let's, let's leave Dante and Milton and everything else that has come since aside. What do heaven and hell look like and what does the end of the world look like? Yeah, so it really depends on what the assumptions of the reader are. If if you're a reader who knows nothing about Milton or Dante or anyone, uh, if is just coming to it, but is is uh, intelligent, um, but tries to reconcile everything, what that person would argue probably is in uh, is in a view of progressive revelation, where the where the ideas that are most true develop over time, and some of the earlier authors don't recognize the truths. Uh, the full truth. They only have partial revelation. And in that understanding of things, the, the idea in the Sheol of the Old Testament, where uh, everybody goes to this kind of netherworld, uh, and they stay in this netherworld forever, that, that gets modified over time until you get into the Gospels, where, where the righteous are rewarded and the wicked are punished, uh, but it looks like they're punished by uh, annihilation. That develops yet further when you get to the book of Revelation, when you find out that, in fact, people are not annihilated. They are... Uh, they're tortured forever. And so the idea then would be that it's all consistent, but only in the sense that there was a progressive revelation. And this reader of the Bible, this hypothetical reader of the Bible then, basically agrees with the final book that mm -hmm. there's eternal torment or eternal reward. 
Islam has a similar concept of of abrogation, where where later verses abrogate earlier verses, and as luck would have it, the the more violent verses tend to abrogate the the more peaceful ones to the benefit of all humanity. So that is viewed in the Christian tradition that progressive revelation not as any sort of data point against this notion of inerrancy. You can still be inerrant even while various gospel writers or or their predecessors are laboring under incomplete knowledge of God's plan. Yeah, it's because of the view of inerrancy that this view developed, because right. you, you have to reconcile these things. And so what a critical scholar would look at and say, well, you know, th- this is just inconsistent. One author has one view and another has another view, and they're they can't be lined up to, then the way to get around that is by saying, yeah, it's progressive revelation. So then what would heaven look like to someone who has gone through this whole progression and come out with, with some kind of final expectation? What, what, is, the, what is the picture of the, the afterlife if you go to the good place? So the, the uh, yeah, so this is the interesting point, is that if you're just sticking with the Bible, uh, you don't have the idea that your soul, you die and your soul goes to heaven forever. It's that at the end of time, uh, bodies are going to be raised from the dead, um, and that there'll be a final judgment on the earth, and God will destroy the forces of evil, and he will um, send everybody who is opposed to him into eternal punishment, but he will raise from the dead uh, all of his righteous, and they'll live here on earth. Uh, forever mm. in a utopian kingdom, and so the earth will be returned to its state, the state that it was in during the days of Adam and Eve, and uh, it'll be a perfect paradise forever. So it is a terrestrial paradise that presumably now functions by a slightly tweaked laws of physics, so that it can last forever here, but it's not somewhere else, and it's not in some ethereal condition. That's right. And and in this view, the tweaking actually happened with Adam and Eve, that originally this world was created as a paradise. Mm. Uh, and the uh, because of their sin, it, it got corrupted. And so uh, God is going to reverse the sin that was brought into the world by Adam and Eve and bring it back to its original state, which is supposed to be a neat place of eternal eternal bliss. I must say, I'm rarely in conversations with Christians about these sorts of things, but this is certainly not a scientific uh, (laughs) poll, but I am certainly walking around with the feeling that most Christians are believing in a very different heaven. I mean, I think think when someone dies close to them, who they think is still in the faith and, and destined for heaven, they're not picturing that person moldering in the ground for thousands of years or whenever, it, however long it takes for Jesus to come back and usher in the end of the world, they're picturing that person, that person's soul, more or less moving directly from the hospital bed or wherever they were when they died into some ethereal condition, which is the afterlife, and it is eternal, and it's, it's in the company of God or Jesus or some circumstance that's just a matter of pure satisfaction and, and well-being. Two questions. Am, am I wrong about that? Is, isn't that what many, if not most, Christians believe? And, and if so, what are the, the, the scriptural antecedents for that belief? Um, that uh, You're right. That, that is the belief. And that's one of the reasons I'm writing this next book about where these Christian ideas of the afterlife came from, because um, most of the Bible doesn't teach them. Uh, you can get to that view from a few passages, uh, sort of random and isolated passages, which um, don't actually say quite that uh, about this ethereal afterlife for souls. But you do get a couple passages in the writings of Paul where he seems to think that, yes, there is going to be this resurrection of bodies at the end of time. But in the meantime, uh, when people die, they, they've got this immediate presence with Christ in heaven. Uh, and I think that that idea that you have this immediate presence with Christ at your death mm. gets transformed into this idea of an ethereal existence. The thing is that uh, most most Christians who have this idea of this kind of existence of your soul but not your body have conflicted views because they also think that when they get to heaven, they'll uh, be able to see their grandmother and talk yeah. with her. Well, I mean, if 
if she doesn't have a body, <laughs> what what are you going to see exactly? And how are you going to recognize her? And you know, so they have to come up with kind of weird explanations for how, in fact, it's your soul, but the soul has the physical appearance of your body or, you know, and even though you don't actually have eyes anymore, you can still see and you can still hear and, and so forth. And how old is your grandmother? Is she is she restored to her the prime age of 30 or is she still granny in that condition? Well, that's right. And if you if you've had an infant child who's died, uh, does, is the child still an infant or you know, do they, what are they in heaven? And so you actually, you have Christians who seriously debate these issues uh, and and actually write books trying to explain uh, what it's really going to be like. I recall St. Thomas Aquinas dealing with some of this stuff. You have Christians debating the uh, all sorts of issues relating to this all the way back into the second Christian century. I mean, you have Christians asking, you know, if the body's raised from the dead at the end of time, and so all of the parts of your body are brought together, what happens if you were eaten by a cannibal so mm-hmm. that part of your body became part of the cannibal's body? So when the parts are raised from the dead, who gets the parts? You or the cannibal? <laughs> mm-hmm. And so you, know, you have people debating this kind of thing all, all the way back. It's tempting to picture the, a very different history where the doctrine of Christianity was just fatally confounded by one cannibal. Yes, right, right. So then what is the picture of hell that one can rationally form on the basis of Scripture. So mo- most of the Bible, of course, is the Old Testament, and in the Old Testament, there isn't a hell, a, a place of torment. There's this place called Sheol, which is a shadowy existence where everybody goes, good or or wicked, believers or non-believers, and it's just you kind of you exist there, and not much happens forever. Um, when you get to the teachings of Jesus, Jesus thought that there'd be a resurrection of the dead at the end of the end of time. And he appears to have thought that those who were opposed to God were not going to be tormented forever. They were going to be annihilated. Uh, Unlike Mm -hmm. the righteous, the righteous will be given an eternal reward, but God will punish the the wicked by destroying them. And Mm -hmm. the Apostle Paul never says anything about hell as a place of eternal torment. It's not really till you get to the book of Revelation that you start getting this eternal torment idea of, you know, of having this lake of fire. Is it Revelation that also gives us the notion of the rapture? Is that, or is that prefigured somewhere else? Is that a, an Old Testament prophecy that then Revelation connects the dots on? Well, this is an interesting point that even most Christians don't know. Uh, the book of Revelation does describe what's going to happen at the end of time, but it does not have a doctrine of the rapture. Uh, there's no rapture in the book of Revelation. The idea of a rapture actually comes from the Apostle Paul. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, oh, Paul right. is talking about what's going to happen at the end when there, there'll be a resurrection of the dead, and he says that Jesus is coming back from heaven, and those who have died in Christ are raised from the dead, uh, and th- those who are living at the time will be taken up with them mm-hmm. into the sky, and they'll meet Jesus there up in the air. So it actually comes from uh, Paul's Paul's letters rather than from the book of Revelation. Mm, right. So now, did you believe in the rapture when you were at this point, at the peak of your faith? Uh, I not only believed in it, I knew it was going to happen before the late 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> wow. So, so then, had you lost your faith by the time the, the late 80s came around, or was that one <laughs> yeah, of the reasons why yeah, you lost it? Well, I'd certainly lost my faith in the rapture by that time. You know, my loss of faith was kind of a long, long-term long process, and uh, the, the rapture was one of the first things to go. So what, what was the first doubt that was truly insuperable? Did it move in, in discernible increments where you, you crossed some kind of bright line and couldn't get yourself back to feeling the faith you had felt the day before? Yeah, there were there were a number of lines, but one the the sort of first moment was when I realized that the Bible was not inerrant. Um, I had uh, my my first year at Princeton Theological Seminary. I was taking a course on the Gospel of Mark, which was based on an interpretation of the Greek text, and so I I knew Greek by this time, and we 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 had to translate the entire Gospel of Mark, and we had to write a we did an interpretation of every every verse. You know, is very deep and detailed. And I had to write a, a term paper, and I wrote a paper 
on a passage in Mark where Jesus is talking about a story in the Old Testament that happens, and he, he says that this account happened when Abiathar was the high priest. This is in Mark chapter 2. When you read the Old Testament account, actually, uh, this, the account that he's summarizing didn't take place when Abiathar was the high priest. It happened when his father Ahimelech was the high priest. So I write this 30-page paper arguing that even though Jesus said that Abiathar was the high priest, he didn't really mean that Abiathar was the high priest. Uh, he knew that Ahimelech was the high priest. So I write this long paper, and the, the professor reads the paper. He likes the paper. gives me an A because I had this complicated grammatical argument. But at the end of it, he said, maybe Mark just made a mistake. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I thought, huh, that'd be easier than 30 pages of dancing around the problem and coming up with this fancy grammatical thing. You know, in fact, yeah, maybe Mark just made a mistake. And once I once I recognized that there could be a mistake, it mm-hmm. opened up the floodgates. Uh, and I started finding mistakes without wanting to. And then I started wanting to. And then I started finding them all over the place. There are mistakes with respect to facts we know outside the the text of the Bible, but there are also just, there are contradictions within the Bible that are, any way you squint your eyes, they are contradictions. I remember there was an old book, I think it's probably 150 years old, I remember I have somewhere in the house, which I, I referenced in my first book, The End of Faith, I think the title is Self-Contradictions in the Bible, and some of these are just, you know, it's just the the coin came up heads or the coin came up tails. You can't believe both. I think one was, you know, John the Baptist was in prison at the time of the crucifixion, or John the Baptist was, you know, somewhere else at the time of the crucifixion. How did you deal with those? Well, you know, the uh, the intellectual uh, task of fundamentalists uh, involves reconciling differences. Uh, and if you work hard enough at it, you can reconcile just about anything. And so, you know, this was, it was like solving a puzzle. Uh, you assume that there are no errors. And if that's your assumption, well, then there are no errors. And the task is to find out why this is not a contradiction. Uh, and so t- today, I mean, when I, when I talk with fundamentalist Christians and try and point out, you know, uh, the Gospel of John says Jesus died the day before the Passover, and the mm. Gospel of Mark says he died the day after the Passover, and they both can't be right. Well, they have a way of reconciling it, <laughs> so mm. that's what you do. So, so what is the hardest thing to reconcile? If you were going to point out one thing that you think stood the best chance of, of toppling the whole house of cards, what is that thing? Well, that the the example I just gave is the one that I use uh, if I want to convince. You know, if I've got one example, uh, I I walk them through what happens in uh, in John's gospel because John explicitly dates the day of Jesus' death as the day before that he explicitly says what time of day and which day it was on, and the Gospel mm-hmm. of Mark also explicitly says what time of day and which day it was on, and they just flat out contradict each other. And so when you take somebody actually through the text and show this to them, then th- th- that does it. What I, what I do with my students is I, uh, I do a number of things with them to, to get them to see how there are different views in the Bible, but one thing I do is I have them compare either the accounts of Jesus' birth in Matthew and Luke or the accounts of his resurrection in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I simply say, look, list everything that happens in this gospel, then list everything that happens in that gospel, and compare your two lists and see if there's anything that is impossible to reconcile. And in both cases, there are things you simply cannot reconcile because they they just contradict each other. Actually, I think we should go back to the the time at which these texts were were written, you know, based on modern scholarship for a moment, because if you accept that there was a significant delay in the composition of of even the earliest Gospels, so if if Mark was 40 years after the, the death of Jesus, and that's the earliest text, just map that on to, you know, our present conversation. It's as though you and I we're now talking about, without the aid of any media, without the aid of any real written materials or, or anything, it's, it's as though you and I are in a world now where we could talk about some historical figure who had a great influence a generation and a half ago. You know, we're talking about JFK or Martin Luther King Jr. Or, or, or somebody who we never met, 
we may not have met anyone who met that person. This person has, there's a kind of a residue of their life's work in the world based on almost entirely verbal accounts. Because again, we don't have the internet, we don't have widespread literacy and, and, and contemporaneous records. We just have rumors of rumors. And now you and I are going to put pen to paper or papyrus and write an account of exactly what happened in the, the last years and weeks and days of this person's life. That's the picture at least I form of what this would look like. And, and the idea that that kind of effort, absent some you know, direct line to an omniscient being who's just simply telling you what happened, that seems like an, an all-too-human enterprise that, if nothing else, will introduce a fair amount of error and creative license and whimsy into the process. Oh, absolutely. So I, one of my earlier books was called Jesus Before the Gospels, and it deals with this problem that these, these stories that the gospel writers produce are stories that have been in oral circulation year after year, decade after decade, before they get written down. And so just to make it concrete, I mean, in the Gospel of Matthew is the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is three chapters of Jesus' sayings, chapters 5, 6, and 7, one saying after the other, parables, sayings, one-liners. So how do we explain this? Matthew is, Matthew is uh, writing probably about uh, 55 years after the fact. Mm. And so this would be like asking somebody today— uh, who has no written records, asking somebody to write down Gerald Ford's first State of the Union address, verbatim, now, mm -hmm. with no records. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, what are the chances anybody's even going to get close? Uh, and so, uh, yeah, obviously there are, there are huge problems that uh, I would say that conservative Christians just have never taken very seriously. In defense of, of the oral tradition, I think there is some scholarship and I know this because this is something that, that Buddhists reference a fair amount, and I guess scholars of the Iliad and the Odyssey reference this as well, because you know, that was oral for the longest time. There is a, a mechanism by which if certain stories and poems and, and text, essentially, before they were written down, are especially important to a tradition, there is a, a, a tradition of, of keeping them alive by really laborious rehearsal and, and recitation. And you can do this successfully and conserve texts in a more reliable form than, than we're letting on here when we just have to imagine the two of us at our desks now magically reiterating what Gerald Ford, that memorable person, said several decades ago. Yeah, no, that's right. So that's what I have to deal with in my book, Jesus Before the Gospels, is what kind of mechanisms were in place in oral traditions in antiquity. And the Iliad and the Odyssey is a good example, because there, there's a famous book by Albert Lord uh, that was published in 1960 called The Singer of Tales, where he shows how it is uh, people uh, in in uh, Yugoslavia, nearby, where Homer would have lived, if Homer lived, how mm. uh, modern uh, people who memorize epic poetry at the same length of him as the Iliad and the Odyssey, how they actually go about their business. And this shows how, how it actually works in that kind of culture. And the most striking thing is that in oral cultures, people have no concern for uh, verbal accuracy over mm. time. Uh, they, th that's a concern that starts developing with the, with the rise of literacy, because with literacy, you're able to compare two texts to tell whether they're the same. But in an oral culture, there's no way to compare the texts, uh, because you've heard it, and you just have to remember it to know if this next iteration of it is the same as the one you just heard. And you might be right or you might be wrong. But, uh, but anyway, so there, there's a whole anthropological study of oral cultures, which is very interesting and is useful for trying to understand something about the, the traditions that went into the Gospels. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you, you have to imagine there'll, there'll be semantic drift. If you can't compare the current rehearsal to any text, and that goes on and on for decades and even centuries, 
the idea that you're actually conserving verbatim what was first said. I mean, you're, you're playing a massive game of telephone with future generations, and it's we know how we know how telephone works out with just a single phrase in a in a room full of kids, and it rarely conserves meaning. So I guess there are a few other sources of doubt here that are related to just the, the disposition of the text. So I mean, one this is one point which I had heard before, but I think I first saw discussed in your book, Misquoting Jesus, where you talk about the timeline of incorporation and and disincorporation of the canon. It took centuries for certain books, I think Revelation might have been one of them, to finally be included. And there were centuries during which some books which are now considered apocryphal were part of the canon. And that piecemeal effort of haggling about the stature of various books, that also seems like a a process that seems very unlikely to be guided by the spirit of, of inerrancy. Were you unaware of that when you were a fundamentalist? Or is, is, that, is that the kind of thing that when true believers hear it, it becomes a basis for doubt? Or is it, is it just, they just don't accept the scholarship on that? Uh, well, I think, they, I think they pretty much accept the scholarship on it because, I mean, it's I mean, at at some point, you sort of face facts that you can't deny. I mean, the 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 first time anybody lists our twenty seven books of the New Testament and says these are the twenty seven, no more, no fewer. These twenty seven is an author named Athanasius, who in a letter that he wrote in the year three sixty seven. So we're talking three hundred years after the books had been in circulation. I think what conservative Christians say is that. Um, uh, that God was guiding the process, and that uh, he, you know, he allows humans to have free will, and so uh, he let them debate it out over a while. But eventually, he made sure they got the right books. <laughs> so, mm. but it's it's absolutely true. I mean, even when Athanasius was writing this letter, there were people who thought that uh, that the Revelation of John, uh, the Book of Revelation, should not be in the New Testament, and there are other people who thought that the Revelation of Peter. Uh, a book that did not make it into the New Testament, that it should be included. And so there were these these debates. And I would say that with my students here uh, at Chapel Hill, my some of my more conservative Christian students, this comes as uh, news. Uh, they've never heard this before, and they've never realized it. They just kind of thought that the Bible descended one day, you know, a few years after Jesus died. And they mm. come to realize that, in fact, it was put together— uh, for a number of reasons, and that there there were a lot of historical contingencies that that went into the construction of the New Testament. And what is the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls in this picture? So the Dead Sea Scrolls are a group of writings produced by by uh, a Jewish sect um, just before the the time of Jesus and slightly after. There they contain um, a number of different kinds of documents, so they're really significant because they show us what the Jewish environment of Jesus might have been like. I mean, they're significant for Christianity for that reason. They're they're right. significant for Judaism for other reasons, but for Christianity, they're significant for that. They don't have any Christian materials in them, so there aren't any gospels or letters or anything by Christians. But what they do show us is what a Jewish uh, one particular Jewish sect considered to be their sacred books. Uh, they include. Uh, virtually all of the books that are in the uh, now in the Old Testament, but also there were other Jewish books that were considered to be authoritative, and these are found as well uh, among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah, so that, that brings me to the picture of, insofar as we can form it, of just what the time was like for Jesus and, and the apostles, and and what they must have thought they were doing. I, mean, I think most Christians live as I, I think it's easy to forget I mean certainly when you consider the history of of anti-semitism which is a you know a largely christian confection it's easy to forget that jesus and the apostles and the virgin mary and basically everyone in sight of note until paul came along and started evangelizing to the pagans they're all jews right couldn't you make the case i i believe you do make this case in your in your most recent book that Jesus never thought he was starting a new religion. He's, he's simply, now obviously I'm accepting for the purposes of this conversation, most of what we think we know about Jesus as being, being true, you know, leaving aside the miracles. Isn't it reasonable to suppose that, that he just thought he was giving the, the correct and pure 
version of the religion he knew, which was Judaism? Uh, I think that's absolutely right. Um, Jesus, uh, the historical Jesus, the man himself, uh, certainly didn't think he was going to be starting a new religion. Um, and uh, his fa- he was a Jew. He was born and raised Jewish. His, his followers were Jews. They kept the Jewish law. They followed Jewish customs. Uh, Jesus was understood to be a Jewish teacher who had, the, for them, the correct interpretation of Judaism. It's not until later that Christianity split off from Judaism and became its own thing. Uh, there are very big debates among scholars, a very uh, a vibrant debate about whether you can actually pinpoint uh, any time or even a period of time when they split. But eventually, of course, Christianity did become a separate thing. But the way it's often put is that Christianity became the religion about Jesus rather than the religion of Jesus. So, mm. so Jesus had a particular religious perspective, which is thoroughly Jewish, and Christianity then became the religion based not so much on Jesus' teachings as upon belief in his death and resurrection, uh, which, is, of course, isn't something Jesus himself would have been preaching about. Right. Now, so how does the concept of the Messiah fit in here? So what is, what is the Jewish concept? What, is, what was Jesus' embrace of it in, in his own ministry? What would the, his fellow Jews have thought of him in, in light of it? And what have Christians done with that concept? Right. So that's a five-hour conversation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so the, the Jewish term Messiah, uh, the word Messiah comes from a Hebrew word, Mashiach, which means anointed one. It's the Hebrew equivalent of the Greek word Christos, mm. uh, which means Christ. And so the word Messiah and the word Christ are the same word. One is Hebrew, one's, one's Greek. In Hebrew circles, in Jewish circles, the king of Israel was called the Anointed One. Uh, he was the one who was favored by God, and so he was anointed by God, shown God's special favor. God promised the, uh, one, one of the great kings of Israel, David, that he would always have a descendant sitting on the throne ruling Israel. And for about 400 years after David's day, that was true. There was a Davidic uh, line of succession that lasted for some 400 years. But eventually, uh, the nation of Judah was destroyed, and uh, the king was taken off the throne. There were Jewish uh, thinkers, though, who thought that God was going to fulfill that promise by bringing a future uh, king to the throne. So there would be a future son of David, somebody who is a descendant of David, who, like him, would be a great political figure, a warrior who destroyed God's enemies and set up Israel as a sovereign state in its land. And Mm. so that future anointed one was then called the Messiah. So that Jews in Jesus' day who talked about a Messiah, most of them thought of someone like that, somebody who'd be a great, powerful figure who destroyed the enemy and became the king. So I would say that, judging from that, the crucifixion of Jesus would not suggest that he was the fulfillment of this expectation or, or prophecy. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just the, that that was the big problem, because Christians, after Jesus' death, wanted to declare that he was the Messiah. And for most Jews, that was crazy, uh, because— he was just the opposite of the Messiah. I mean, if the Messiah is supposed to destroy the enemy and become the king, Jesus was publicly humiliated and tortured to death by mm-hmm. the enemy. So it's just, just the opposite, which is why Christians had very difficult time converting Jews uh, once they, they started, you know, after Jesus' death. They, they ended up converting far more Gentiles because most Jews just didn't buy it. And do you think that was the, the main reason why they didn't buy it? Yeah, I think it's absolutely the main reason. Paul, the Apostle Paul himself says that the crucifixion of Jesus is the major stumbling block for Jews. And that's what he means, is that, you know, mm-hmm. they, they're expecting a Messiah, and Jesus is, is, is contrary to everything they expected, so they, of course they don't think that he's the Messiah. So there are passages in the Gospels that are, are putting words in the mouth of Jesus. So there's the, there are the passages that purport to be his actual utterances. And then there are all the passages that describe what he said and did that are not actually in quotes of his. Is there anything that Jesus said that 
made it clear that he thought he was the Messiah? Because he makes, there are certainly things he said that seem grandiose in a theological sense, but does that, is there a straightforward connection between any of his utterances and the claim that he's the Messiah? Yeah, it's very complicated, and it's much debated among, uh, among critical scholars. Uh, of course, you know, conservative Christians would just say, well, yeah, he says he's the Messiah, so he's the Messiah. But the question is, the one you're raising, given the fact there are so many other things in the Gospels, how do we know? And I think there actually are sayings that indicate that Jesus did think that he was the Messiah in some sense. Um, one of the sayings that I think it absolutely must go back to Jesus is a saying found in a couple of the Gospels, it's in Matthew and Luke, where Jesus tells his 12 disciples, he says to them, that when the kingdom of God arrives, you 12 will be seated on 12 thrones, ruling the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, so ancient Israel was originally organized in 12 tribes, and Jesus is saying that in the new people of God, uh, at the end of time, the disciples would be the 12 rulers. Uh, the reason I think Jesus absolutely must have said that is because among his disciples was Judas Iscariot. And so Jesus in this saying would be say, telling Judas Iscariot, his ultimate betrayer, that he'd mm. be the ruler. Well, that's not the kind of saying that a later Christian would make up and put on his lips, because the later Christian would know that Judas had betrayed him, which means Jesus really said this. But if Jesus really said this, then he was teaching his disciples that they would be 12 rulers of the future kingdom. If they're going to be the 12 rulers of the future kingdom, who's going to rule them? Uh, Jesus is the one who chose them, and mm -hmm. it's by following his teachings that they'll get into the kingdom. So I think Jesus thought he was going to be the king of this future kingdom, and that he would ultimately would be the Messiah, the, the anointed one from God. Well, there's a lot in there that I, I want to tease out. So first of all, there's this principle that you just invoked, which I'd forgotten, which is paradoxically anything that seems to be an error or seems to be, you know, signal that there's, you know, Jesus has now said something or done something that's inconvenient for future writers of, of the gospel. That is yet more evidence of its veracity and, and reliability, because what propagandist would have put a seemingly false statement into the mouth of Jesus? That's an interesting lens through which to look at this, and, and there, there must be many other examples of this sort of thing. There are, and um, so scholars who do this kind of thing call that the criterion of dissimilarity. And so if there's, a, if there's a saying of Jesus that is dissimilar to what the later Christian storytellers would have wanted him to say, you know, if you have a saying like that, they, they didn't make it up, so where did it come from? Uh, mm. It probably goes back to Jesus himself to follow that line a little bit further. So what do you do with the, the radical skeptical claim that occasionally comes from some quarters, from more and less educated people theologically, that there's no good reason to believe that Jesus, the historical person, even existed? I mean, he's some, he stands a chance of being mythical because of how little there is. I mean, there, there's nothing outside the Bible if I'm not mistaken, that attests to his existence. Is there anything that we have from kind of Roman records or any other source other than, than Scripture? Right. So, so the, the people who argue this are called mythicists. Uh, they are a really very tiny fringe group. Um, I, I actually wrote a book on this question called mm. Did Jesus Exist? <laughs> <laughs> where I where I marshal all the evidence uh, that that whatever else you might think about him, uh, Jesus almost certainly existed. In terms of Roman evidence, uh, the answer is during the during his lifetime. No, there's no Roman evidence. But you know, there's of course no Roman evidence for ninety nine point ninety nine percent of the empire. But uh, yep. you know, so so it's not strange that there's no evidence. It's just there isn't any evidence until the second century. There are uh, Roman historians who start mentioning Jesus in the early 2nd century. We have a 1st century source, uh, a Jewish historian, Josephus, a non-Christian Jewish source that mentions Jesus and talks about him a little bit. But basically, we're restricted to Christian evidence. Um, but even so, uh, the Christian evidence is of such a character and such magnitude that even skeptical New Testament scholars, I mean, people who are actually New Testament scholars, nobody, almost nobody really doubts that he existed, whatever mm. else you want to say about him. Yeah, I mean, what you have to 
put at some point in the past to explain the the first and second century accounts is some cause that doesn't entail the existence of a real person who who fit this description that got a cult of people fixated on this person who didn't exist. The idea that there wasn't any charismatic rabbi at the bottom of it, that seems a little bit Well, that's far-fetched. right. And, it, and the thing is, it's so massively widespread that that fictional character somehow has to be known. And, you know, with the Apostle Paul, uh, you know, <laughs> Paul, in, in an off-the-cuff comment, talks about Jesus' brother James, whom Paul knows. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's not quite the same as having somebody say, you know, well, I knew Jesus, but Paul Paul knew his brother. (laughs) So uh, that's, yeah, that's pretty good evidence that he actually existed. If you're going to lie so as to make it the existence of a fictional person seem plausible for reasons of starting a cult that you were evangelizing for for the rest of your life, it seems like you would say more than you just happen to know his brother. Well, that's right. And you wouldn't. And the thing is, if you actually trace the chronology of Paul's life, it looks like he converted maybe two or three years after Jesus' death. Mm. And before that, he tells us he was he was persecuting Christians. And so you have people who were believing Jesus was Messiah just within a year, you know, demonstrably within a year or two of his death. And so you're not talking about something that somebody fabricated, you know, and then started circulating, you know, some years later. It yeah, anyway, I, there's a lot of evidence that one could deduce, but that he existed, I think, is pretty certain. You know, with, with this idea of this criterion of dissimilarity, that, that something is probably authentic if it's dissimilar to what the Christian storytellers would want to say, what I would argue is that that's just a solid historical criterion, and yeah. it's not all that different from what happens in a legal case in court. You know, if you've got a witness who is testifying contrary to his or her own best interest, then, you know, the, probably that testimony is reliable. Now, on this on this point of scoring passages as more or less reliable. I remember there was a a group called the Jesus Seminar that used to do that, where they would sort of color code the passages they had the the greatest confidence in. Is that is that still happening? And is that did that or does that have real stature among scholars? Well, the Jesus Seminar was uh, was an unusual phenomenon. Uh, so it was a group of about fifty scholars, they, and uh, you know they were they were bona fide scholars. Most of them were university professors, or you know teaching in Christian liberal arts colleges. Some of them, and but some of you know some of them were were well known scholars. Um, and you're right. What they did is they went line by line through all of Jesus' sayings, and they voted. Uh, they they discussed them. They argued about them. They they looked at the scholarship on them. They studied them in Greek and reconstructed the Aramaic, and they did all the stuff. And uh, but then they would vote. And if they if there was a saying if if there was a saying that they thought Jesus really said this, they would vote red. If, well, pretty much kind of like that pink, if not so much gray, and if not at all, he didn't say this, they'd vote black. So everybody votes, and then they tally the votes, and they print, printed then a four-colored edition of the Gospels where, uh, you know, some sayings were black, some gray, some pink, and some red. So, I mean, a lot of other scholars who weren't in the Jesus Seminar thought that it was kind of a silly proceeding, and it— you know, it just didn't seem very dignified. Mm. <laughs> and so, but yeah, but but some of them were good scholars. And so, you know, in, in another respect, that is kind of how scholarship works, right? A consensus gets established, and there will be some scholars who disagree and some who are more convinced than others. But this just took it to a, a kind of a silly level. So back to what you were saying about Jesus thinking of himself as the Messiah and, and promising his apostles their own fiefdoms. That picture of the end of the world and then the fulfillment of prophecy, it's pretty clear that everyone was expecting that to happen in their lifetime, right? No one was expecting a good long wait of millennia before kind of the reconquest of, of the earth for the glory of God was achieved, right? Well, G- Jesus himself certainly wasn't expecting millennia, and his followers and, G- and Paul weren't. They, I mean, Jesus himself in the Gospels says that uh, his own generation will see it happen. And he mm-hmm. tells his disciples that some of them aren't going to die before it happens, and so it's supposed to happen in their lifetime. And that's certainly what Paul himself thought. Paul thought he would be alive when it happened. And the irony, of course, is that every generation of Christians since then has had people who thought it's going to happen in their generation. 
And the one thing they've all had in common is they've all been wrong about mm-hmm. that. <laughs> but so then what do fundamentalists do with that clear expectation that this was going to be fulfilled in, in, first, in the context of a, a first century Roman imposition? What they typically say is that God's calendar is not our calendar, and soon for God is not the same as soon for us. And so uh, Jesus might say it's going to happen soon, but, uh, you know, by, in God's calendar, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. So if it's, you know, three days away, that could be 3,000 years. And even if you're the Son of God, you can be getting it wrong or, or seeming to get it wrong? No, no, because the Son of God is, has God's calendar. Uh, we're the ones who have the wrong calendar. <laughs> so, he, so he didn't say anything that suggests that he had an expectation that was clearly not borne out? I mean, was it, when he was talking about reigning on earth at, at some future point, his coming crucifixion isn't a, an insult to that picture? No, it absolutely is an insult to it. And so Uh, What I'm saying, I mean, historically, Jesus almost certainly predicted that the end was going to come within his generation, Uh, and the disciples uh, believed he would be the Messiah who would be sitting on the throne. Mm. So when he was crucified, that absolutely disabused them of that idea. Uh, And that's why the resurrection is, the belief in the resurrection is is how Christianity, this, this new idea, starts. Uh, right. the, the new idea being that it's the death and resurrection of Jesus that changes uh, a person's relationship to God, not not the coming eschaton. I guess another principle here that has always bewildered me morally more than intellectually, and it's this notion that the significance of, of Christ's crucifixion, it is an endorsement of the moral logic of human sacrifice. And the human sacrifice is something that has occurred in a wide variety of cultures, and it's, it was just widely believed, almost universally believed, that our species lived in perpetual relationship to invisible gods of various sorts who could be propitiated with human sacrifice. And, and then, you know, you, you get animal sacrifice beginning to stand in for human sacrifice in the Old Testament. And things like, you know, rituals like circumcision standing in for, you get these more and more attenuated sacrifices. But, but human sacrifice is, is a virtual cultural universal. And the logic of Christ dying for our sins and, and redeeming them by his sacrifice is the logic of human sacrifice. And so it's, you know, I've thought of Christianity as a, in large measure, an unwitting cult of human sacrifice. It's not, that you, it's not that you get some different moral order. You just get this doctrine or this mere assertion, really, that human sacrifice is indeed important. It's, it is what God wants and requires. It's the whole story morally, but there was only one that was truly necessary, and indeed it was, it was effective. It was accomplished in the life of Jesus. Right. I mean, as you know, as somebody who's a a non-Christian looking in, this looks very peculiar indeed, and and fairly ghastly. And the the logic that you just laid out makes perfect sense to people who are not Christians. For people inside Christianity, for some reason, it ju- that that logic just doesn't resonate uh, because they just you know it, I don't know they don't connect they don't connect the dots. But you know it. It's a kind of a strange world where you think that God requires his son to be tortured to death so that he can forgive people. Mm. Why can't he just forgive people? I mean, you know, when, when my son does something wrong, I don't, you know, tell him I'm going to kill his pet dog in order to make up for it. You know, I just forgive him. <laughs> so, yeah. But apparently God requires, yeah, doesn't require the death of a dog. He requires the death of a, his own child. And uh, that is... That, you know, the thing is, you know, sophisticated Christian theologians realize that the doctrine of the atonement is, the, is, is something they just can't get around. I mean, it's just, they, they don't have a good explanation for it. Uh, but they, you know, they try to. But uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty awful doctrine. And it, it's among several other points that suggest that the morality of God is something that we would consider evil if it were the morality of a person. It's like, this is what sort of God is it that, as you said, requires the torture and death 
of his own son to to forgive the the flaws of creatures that he created to be flawed, right? And what what sort of God is it who creates a scheme where the difference between eternal happiness and eternal torment is to be realized by merely believing the right things, but he hasn't given sufficient evidence so as to persuade people to believe the right things. And you have evil people who just by no accomplishment of their own just happen to be indoctrinated into the right things. And you have good people who, despite all of their good works, will spend an eternity in fire because they never heard the gospel. I mean, this whole picture of how souls are damned and saved, if it were created by the hand of a person, if this were a psychological experiment that, that you know, we created and forced others to live through, you know, this would be the most sadistic enterprise imaginable. And yet, we're asked to believe that a, a wholly good and compassionate God has set the universe up this way. And, you know, obviously, the, the Muslims and other religious adherents play the same game and believe mutually incompatible sets of people will be damned and saved thereby. But the idea that anyone thinks this is the foundation of a truly unimpeachable morality standing outside the tradition, it's very hard to wrap one's head around. Well, that's right. And it's, you know, it's, you know anybody who um, is a child of the Enlightenment can't make sense of any of that. Uh, when, you try, when you try that argument on conservative Christians, you know, the, their response is simply, well, who are you to question God? <laughs> so, <laughs> so rationality kind of parks its brains at the door when it comes to certain doctrines. And um, that isn't true of all Christians. Of course, there are, there are Christians who are very sophisticated, but the, a lot of Christians are very sophisticated. But, but that basic logic that God requires a human sacrifice or that— and it isn't just that. I mean, you know, you, you, get, a, you get a Bible where, where God tells his people to go in and murder entire populations, yeah. uh, you know, including the, the Amalekites. children. The Amalekites, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, no, there are problems with it. Now I, I realize we've been talking for, for an hour and a half, and we have not yet come to the, the subject of your current book. So this is, this is my skill as an interviewer manifest. But there's just been so much that I've wanted to cover with you, and it's, it's all fascinating. But let, let's converge on your book. The first question I have here is, is more general, but it is a topic that I know you broach in your, in your current book. And it's this kind of yet another inconvenient fact, I think, for the picture of, of what Scripture is and what the, what the, the coherence of, the, of the, the ultimate doctrine of Christianity. And it's this concept of henotheism, this idea that the religion of Judaism and, and Christianity, I think one could argue, isn't really monotheism. It's not that it's believed that there is only one God. It's that there's a multiplicity of gods, but there's only one that should be worshipped. There's one that's more powerful than others. Is that, I mean, do I have the, the concept of henotheism right? Yeah, that's, that is the concept of henotheism. And there are fuzzy lines, obviously, between among all these things, you know, whether that's polytheism or, and what's the relationship to that to monotheism. But that, but that is the idea, that henotheism, there's one god uh, that is to be worshipped, even though there are other gods. And there's evidence for this in the Bible. I, mean, I think there might be other places, but the one I recall is in Genesis, where this is after Adam and Eve have eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and God talking to someone who's not, he's not talking to Adam or Eve or the serpent, he's, he's talking to someone who, you know, off camera, and he says something like, now that man has eaten of, of the tree, he should not be able to pick from the tree of life, lest he become like us and live forever, or something, something like that. Like, there's, a, there's an implication of of a multiplicity of, of characters there, is there more evidence that we're, we're not in a, in a monotheistic world when we're, when we're talking about the Bible? Yeah, it actually happens earlier. It does happen there, and it happens earlier. When God creates humans, he says, let us make man in our own image. Uh, and so, you know, that seems to be presupposing other divine beings. And it becomes even more clear uh, later on when God gives the Ten Commandments to, to Moses. The first commandment is, mm. you shall have no other gods before me. 
Right. Well, uh, that presupposes that there are other gods. You're just not supposed to worship them ahead of, of this god, Yahweh. Uh, and so it looks like a, that. So my, my view is that ancient Israel originally was, like everyone else, was polytheistic. But at some point, they came to focus on the one god, Yahweh, which was the god to be worshipped. And so then they were henotheistic. And eventually, there were, uh, there were Jews uh, in the days of Jesus, certainly, who were monotheistic, who thought, no, these other gods are not really gods. There, there's only one god. And this became a source of disagreement among Jews and even among Christians about what to call these other beings who are, they're not human, uh, they're superior to humans, but they're not as, as exalted as God. So are they gods or are they something else? So your, your new book, The Triumph of Christianity, is a description of how Christianity spread so far and wide and how it is we're, we come to be living in a world where Christianity is, is the most well-subscribed religion, and there, there are a few characters in this story who, who have primacy, and, and I think the first is probably Paul, who, you know, even more than Jesus himself, explains how this thing spread. What do we know about Paul and, and his conversion and, and how he converted others? Yeah, no, Paul, I, I argue in the book that Paul is probably the most significant convert in the history of Christianity for the entire history. Um, and I, you know, he fits into my picture because what, what I'm trying to do in the book is try to explain how you get from a tiny group of Jesus' disciples after his death, so like uh, 11 men and a handful of women, how you get from 20 people to centuries, three centuries later, they're being like, three or four million people. How how's that happen? And I argue that Paul is really central for that uh, for a specific reason. Uh, I, I do not argue that Paul is the one who invented Christianity, as some mm -hmm. people claim. You know, I don't claim that he was the founder of Christianity. Uh, Christian, believe, people were believing that Jesus' death and resurrection brought salvation before Paul. What mm -hmm. Paul's innovation was, was that Paul came to realize that this this death and resurrection of Jesus would make a person right with God whether or not they were Jewish. And so Paul's conversion was a recognition that God's message of salvation was not only to Jews, so that if somebody became a follower of Jesus, they didn't have to become Jewish, which meant if they were a man, they didn't have to get circumcised. And if they were male or female, they didn't have to keep kosher food laws, they didn't have to observe the Sabbath or other festivals. They could remain Gentile, but they could still be a follower of Jesus. This mm -hmm. opened up the floodgates for non-Jews to become followers of Jesus, and that made all the difference. What do we know about his conversion? Because he was, he described himself, first of all, his name was Saul, and he had his his road to Damascus conversion, and I, th I think he, in some of his letters, describes himself as having persecuted the followers of Jesus initially. What do we know about, yeah. or what so, can we glean about that? We have two sources of information. Uh, we have, uh, in the book of Acts, which is the fifth book of the New Testament, there's actually a narrative, uh, a description of the spread of Christianity through the Roman Empire, and it has a narrative description of the story of Paul's conversion that's actually narrated three times in the book of Acts. And then we have Paul's own letters, where Paul himself refers on several occasions to his, uh, to his conversion. And so what scholars have to do is to try and figure out whether the book of Acts has reliable information in it or not, or whether some of its material is legendary. And it's almost certain that some of it's legendary. But when you, when you, do a, when you give a critical evaluation of Acts and you compare it to what Paul himself has to say, uh, you get a pretty clear picture. Paul started out as a as a non-believer in Jesus, who was Jewish, a very uh, avid uh, Jewish uh, young person, apparently, who was committed to the traditions of Judaism, who, when he found out about uh, the people saying that Jesus was the Messiah, began persecuting them because he thought that this was an offensive, uh, even blasphemous view, that, that a crucified mm -hmm. man could be the Messiah. But then he had some kind of experience. He describes it as actually having seen Jesus alive. Uh, this must have been two or three years after Jesus' crucifixion, and so Paul interpreted this as meaning that God had brought him back to life. In other words, that, that there had been a mm -hmm. resurrection. And once he came to believe that Jesus had been raised from the dead, 
he uh, because he saw thought he saw him. Uh, then he came to think that the death itself must have mattered. Uh, because mm. God wouldn't raise him from the dead unless he was God's favored one. But if he was God's favored one, why did God allow him to be tortured to death? Well, that must have been all according to plan. And that's how Paul started developing his idea that the death and resurrection of Jesus is what brings about salvation. I wonder what it means to be sure you've seen someone who should be dead now walking among you in a world where there, there is no media. Right. So like, well, like, how do you know what Jesus looks like? He was, in a, he was wearing a name tag. <laughs> <laughs> he met at a conference. Yeah. It strikes me as a, as a non-trivial concern. It's like, unless there's some, there must, there must have been some other yeah. supernatural affectation there. There has to be light or some, some communication from somebody who's, who's right. not obeying the laws of physics, who says, I, I'm, I'm Jesus. Is there anything describing the moment of conversion in Paul's letters? Well, so the first thing to say is in the book of Acts, it's what happens. Jesus identifies himself mm. uh, as Jesus. In Paul's letters, Paul, set, Paul gives a very truncated account and it's because he's writing to people who were his own converts. So they know perfectly well what happened because he's probably told it to them a hundred times. And so when he's writing his letters, he, you know, he doesn't know that they're going to be read 2,000 years later by people who have no idea what he's talking about. What he mm. says was that uh, he says two things. He does say that he saw the resurrected Jesus that Jesus, after his resurrection, appeared to uh, Peter and to all the apostles and to 500 people at one time, and last of all, he appeared to Paul. Uh, so he says that. Um, but the other thing he says when he's talking about his conversion is he describes it as the time when God revealed his Son to me. And so I think the way to understand this is that Paul had been persecuting the Christians who themselves had been saying Jesus was raised from the dead. And so he had Jesus on his mind, mm -hmm. and he had some kind of experience that he interpreted as a personal vision of this one that the Christians had been talking about. And, you know, if he had— if he hadn't heard about Jesus and hadn't been persecuting his followers, this certainly wouldn't have happened. Uh, but I think that psychologically, it's because Jesus was on his, on his mind. Is there a record of disagreement among the apostles? What did Peter think of Paul, and what do we know from either Paul's letters or any of the other Gospels about just how the, the apostles interacted? If you read the book of Acts, which is about the apostles and their spread of Christianity, it will look like they didn't disagree on anything. They were completely harmonious up and down the line about every major issue. When you read Paul's letters, it's pretty clear that, in fact, there was a good deal of controversy. Uh, Paul himself, in that same letter I was just quoting, uh, the letter to the Galatians, Paul talks about a major falling out that he had with Peter uh, mm -hmm. over an important issue about whether whether Jewish Christians had to keep the laws of Judaism or not. Paul said, absolutely not, and Peter said, yes, and they had a public argument about it and a falling out that it looks like Paul actually lost the argument. Uh, hmm. And so there, were, there were actually were a lot of disagreements and a lot of tension as Christianity was developing uh, and people had different views of everything. And there's a section in your book where you, you kind of run through an imaginative exercise trying to think through what it would be like for Paul to have been converting people. And he's, he's somebody who is doing this in, in a clearly a very, a fairly retail way, you know, just moving from place to place, establishing churches, and he's functioning like a, a politician on a perpetual campaign. What do you think we know about the process of, of spreading the, the good word? So we, we have to go on the basis of hints that he gives us in his letters. Um, in a couple of his letters, he talks about how he worked while he was among his potential converts. He worked night and day while he was preaching the gospel to them. And so the, the, the view of scholarship for the last 20 years or so has been that Paul had a mobile trade of some kind. And in the New Testament, he's said to be a tent maker. Uh, it might be that he was a leather good worker. Tents were made out of leather. So he might, he mm. might, have, a, a, he might have worked with leather. 
And probably what he did is he went from one town to another. He'd go to Corinth, and he would, he would set up a shop in Corinth as a leather goods shop. And when people would come into the shop, he would preach to them about his, his views of Jesus. These people were pagans, uh, almost all pagans. And so he, he would have to convince them that there's only one God and that Jesus was the Son of God who died and rose from the dead. And he would tell them stories to convince them about Jesus' great miraculous powers. And uh, so the way he's doing it, just in kind of practical terms, is he's setting up these uh, business in town and converting people who come in. And then, you know, the big question is what exactly he was saying to convince them. But, but the m- mechanics of it appear to be kind of preaching on the job. I'm going to guess there's a, a text in a cave somewhere about the most annoying leather worker who ever came to our <laughs> town. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, he, he, you know, he ticked off of most people he talked to, and he, he talks about how he's constantly being persecuted and beat up and, and flogged, and so uh, he wasn't well-received uh, by most people. But hmm. what I argue in my book is he didn't have to have a massive uh, success rate. He only right. had to convert a person now and then in order to accomplish what he accomplished. I think it's worth lingering on just what we know about the, the, the phenomenology and, and sociology of these kinds of encounters of where persuasion is attempted and achieved by a, a religious figure or you know, someone who's spreading a, a cultic message. And As I was reading your reconstruction of, of Paul's ministry, I, I I was thinking I had recently heard the podcast about the, the Heaven's Gate cult. Did you happen to listen to that podcast? No, I didn't. Heaven's no. Gate. So it's very interesting. The, the, the guy does a pretty deep exploration of, of just how that cult got started. And you, you, you have audio of, of Marshall Applewhite, who's the, one of the two leaders. And, but some of the accounts, and so in this, obviously this is very recent history. This is, these are facts about which we have a lot of data. So this is not this is well attested because you know we have the the parents of these people who who got inducted into this cult and we have their video testimony and this is obviously totally unlike what we have in the case of Christianity but the unfolding of this message and the its successful persuasion of many people and and many apparently smart well educated people is really it really defies belief when you stand outside this. And so there's one account where Marshall Applewhite and his partner were, were giving one of their first lectures about, you know, their beliefs. And their beliefs are, you know, it's the most cockamamie set of, of otherworldly claims you've ever heard. It's, it's relevant that it is explicitly parasitic on Christianity. So the, in most cases, they're talking to Christians and they're giving a, a quasi-Christian message, but it, it's, it's got UFOs and, and other details that are that are not Christian. But at their, one of their first lectures, I think it was in Portland or some other town in Oregon, they were talking to a group of people, you know, 50 or 75 people, and something like a dozen, at the end of that lecture, something like a dozen people just dropped their lives and followed Marshall Applewhite into the wilderness. I mean, just like the biblical moment of leaving everything behind. And that, that kind of thing happens. I mean, these are people who had kids, these are people who had relationships, and they just abandoned everything. And we have video of, of just what sort of speaker Marshall Applewhite was and, and, this, and the kinds of claims he made about the nature of reality. And the idea that anyone's going to drop their life and follow that guy into the wilderness is pretty hard to square. But it certainly happens, and this is the kind of thing we can picture happening in, in Paul's case. Yeah, no, that's right. You know, the, I think for a lot, of, um, a lot of us today, you know, the big stumbling block is, you know, could a miracle probably happen? No, of course miracles don't happen. So the big stumbling block is, you know, how could you convince somebody that this miracle happened? But in the ancient world, everybody thought the miracles happened. And so it's like, you know, a cult leader preaching to Christians today, conservative Christians today, they already agree that there are miracles. The question yeah. is, you know, are these miracles? And, and so, so it isn't the question of whether a miracle is possible. So when, when Paul's preaching to people, he doesn't have to convince them that it's possible that God raised Jesus from the dead. He, uh, they, they know that's possible. He just has to give them 
you know, to show them that it actually happened, not that it's possible to have happened. Uh, and so it made it, it made it much easier. Mm -hmm. So let's fast forward a few centuries to the conversion of Constantine, which is often credited as being the really the, the, the whole story as to why Christianity endures to the degree that it does today, that it just it became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Your account of the significance of Constantine was new to me, and, and it's certainly interesting. It's, it's, it's less significant in your view. So describe the, the role that, that Constantine played or, or didn't play there. Yeah, no, it is a different view. And I actually, my first chapter, as you know, is, is devoted to the conversion of Constantine, which, it, and the reason I begin with that is because people have typically thought that that's what did it. You know, that, that's why the Roman Empire converted, because of Constantine, the emperor, becoming a Christian in the early 4th century. And when I started thinking about all this years ago, that's what I thought. Uh, but what I argue in my book is that actually at the rate it was growing at the time, Christianity was going to take over anyway, even if Constantine hadn't converted. If, if Christianity continued at that rate, it, by the end of the 4th century, the Roman Empire was going to be Christian. So then what's the significance of Constantine? Um, well, so I, I say several things. One thing is that Constantine did not make Christianity the state religion. Uh, Christ, uh, that didn't happen until the end of the 4th century under the Emperor Theodosius. Uh, but what I argue is that Constantine's conversion was significant because prior to this, Christianity had been being persecuted by the Roman Empire, by the imperial apparatus, and now the imperial apparatus was changed to support Christianity. Um, so it isn't what made Christianity take over, but it did open the door for elites to join the Christian faith, and it made it a perfectly legitimate religion. It wasn't the only religion, but it was legitimate. And so um, uh, so it, you could say that it greased the wheels a little bit, but uh, basically I think it was going to happen anyway. But there were future emperors who then made it the, the official religion and then obviously persecuted pagans. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so by the, what happens is Constantine converts, and after he dies, his sons become emperors, and they're Christian. And you, you basically, you have Christians all the way through until uh, 361. So uh, Constantine converts in the year 312, and he dies in the year 337. So he was, he was a Christian for 25 years on the throne. And his sons then are, are emperors. It's his nephew, Julian, who becomes the emperor in the year 361. And Julian decides he wants to become a pagan, and he tries to convert the empire back to paganism. But Julian uh, only ruled for a year and a half. Uh, he was killed in a military conflict. And so uh, after him, every emperor was a Christian, including at the end of the 4th century, Theodosius, who was a gung-ho Christian. And he, mm. uh, he more or less made Christianity the official religion of the empire and instituted laws that were making paganism out, uh, illegal. And so that's when you start getting persecutions of both pagans and Jews. Well, Bart, this has been fascinating. I just want to, I want to end with some kind of rapid fire questions. I went out on Twitter and asked and told people we were going to be doing this podcast and there was a lot of interest and you can, you can be as brief as you want on these. How much of Christianity was appropriated from paganism? Uh, some certainly was, starting all the way back in the Gospels. Jesus is portrayed like a, a pagan son of God who's miraculously born, who can heal the sick and raise the dead, and at the end of his life he ascends to live in heaven. We have accounts of uh, pagan sons of God like that. Uh, and a number of Christian uh, practices and rituals were familiar to pagans. And so I think Christians weren't preaching something entirely new. Uh, they were using the language uh, that, that people understood at the time. There's a, um, an overtly political question here. I don't know if you have an opinion about this, but how do you explain evangelical support for Trump, given that he's perhaps the least credible religious candidate we've had, in, in, uh, certainly in living memory? Well, it's one of the most remarkable aspects of our current political situation, um, that evangelicals support a man who's a serial liar and uh, who uh, just engages in flagrant immorality and flaunts it. Um, but the reason evangelicals do that is because they have a certain uh, red-button issues uh, that we all know about. 
uh, uh, opposed to abortion, in favor of gun control and uh, American America First. These are these are uh, understood to be Christian issues, and since Trump supports them, uh, mm. they're willing to put up with somebody who is just hopelessly immoral and uh, unethical because it allows them to to achieve their their political ob objectives. Uh, there's a question here about. I think we probably have covered it, but maybe there's there's some facts that could be added. Can you say something about the process by which Jesus came to be thought of as divine as opposed to just a, a especially important Jewish preacher? Is it, does it all come down to the, the resurrection, or what, what are the elements here? So people in the ancient world generally understood that there were some human beings who were honored at the end of their life by taking up into the heavenly realm. In pagan circles, they were taken up to live with the gods. And when somebody goes up to live with the gods, they become a god. They become an mm. immortal. Uh, and even in Jewish circles, it was understood that some people were made uh, divine in some sense by being exalted to heaven. Uh, Jesus was understood to have been raised from the dead, and it wasn't just that his body was resuscitated, it was that he was taken up to live with God. And so immediately, as soon as the Christians came to believe in Jesus' exaltation, they came, they came to start thinking of him as a divine being. And over the course of several centuries, he got more and more exalted until he came to a point where he was understood to be fully equal with God in every way for all eternity. What do we know about the role of women in the early church? Jesus himself had women followers, which was somewhat unusual. Uh, the Apostle Paul, even though he has a reputation for being misogynist, the reputation is probably uh, unearned and undeserved. Uh, Paul had women who were very active in his churches. He talks about women who were, who were ministers, and uh, even he names one woman who was foremost among the apostles. Uh, eventually, as soon as the men uh, men gained in power, as soon as the, the religion grew, men grew more numerous, and they silenced the women uh, until you get documents such as those in the New Testament, which say that women shouldn't have positions of leadership. But originally, they uh, they certainly did have. But wasn't it Paul who said that you should not suffer a woman to teach or something like that? So there are two passages in the Pauline letters where Paul says that women have to be silent in church. One is in the book of First Timothy, which is a book that Paul did not write, uh, mm. if somebody who was forging a letter in Paul's name. And the other is in First Corinthians, a book that he did write, but it's in a passage that appears to have been interpolated into the, into the letter by a later scribe. One question here about just what it's like to lose one's faith. So this is for you. How does he suggest those of us who've grown up within the American Christian subculture and come to doubt it, how do you suggest that they move forward into the light of you know, rationality and secularism? And what's at stake personally with respect to social networks and livelihoods and marriages and all the rest? Just what, how, do you have I guess it's a question about what you advise as well, but just give us your, your sense of what that means for somebody. Well, it can be very difficult. Uh, it can be difficult emotionally and socially, uh, especially if you are married to somebody who is not experiencing the same kind of transformation. But my view is that you have to be true to yourself and you have to follow um, the truth wherever it leads you. Um, my view about Emotionally, that's just very hard, because if you're raised believing you're going to burn in hell if you don't believe the right things, uh, that's tough. It's tough leaving communities of faith uh, because they fill a void in your life, and it's hard to replace that void. Um, but it's also hard in terms of relationships. My, the most difficult is the relationships, but my view is that there are some things more important than personal religious beliefs, and uh, love for one another is far more important, and it's better to be honest with somebody in love uh, than to be dishonest and pretend to believe something you don't believe. So yeah, I guess this just sparks a final question from me to you about what it's like to teach this material to each new batch of students, I would imagine a significant percentage of whom are believers. How do you navigate that and, and put pressure or not on their faith in an academic context? Right. So, you know, I teach in North Carolina, so I'm in the Bible Belt, and most of my students are conservative Christians who have been raised in the church, 
who have never heard any of the scholarship before. Uh, my view, uh, so first thing I'll say is that I'm not, I'm not um, out to deconvert anybody or to, uh, or to make them leave their religious faith or to make them uh, agnostic or atheist like I am. I, uh, my view is that I want people to be more intelligent in whatever they, they believe. Um, and I believe that since there's a, supposed to be a separation of church and state, that uh, I don't have any right imposing my personal religious beliefs or unbeliefs on, on others. But what I do have a right to do is to teach the history of early Christianity. And in my opinion, uh, teaching religion in the South is the ideal situation for a university education. Because mm. if a university education, in part, is supposed to make people learn how to think, uh, there's nothing that works better than religion in the South. Because when I teach my classes and students start seeing that there are discrepancies in the Bible uh, or contradictions or uh, beliefs that don't make sense in light of the modern world uh, or in what we know from science or from, from uh, sociology or anthropology, they, they, they're, they're brought up short because they're realizing that what they've always thought just naturally is true doesn't stand up to scrutiny, and so it forces them to think about it. And so I don't require them to take a particular view on this, but I do insist that students think about it and become more thoughtful human beings. But I must imagine that you, in teaching this subject matter and in exposing all of these, these reasons for, for doubt, your scholarship is what brought you to doubt the truth of Christian doctrine, you must run into a crisis of faith on the part of, of many of your students, and you, you might run into their parents objecting to, the, to your, your influence on them. How do you deal with the fallout of teaching this material in the first place? You know, I have never, uh, in my 30 years teaching at Chapel Hill, UNC Chapel Hill, I've never had a, a parent complain to me mm. about anything. Um, the you know the thing about my classes are the thing is that my classes are about the history of early Christianity, including the history of of the New Testament, and that scholarship uh, for me is what led me away from being a fundamentalist, but it did not lead me away from being a Christian. Mm. The reason I stopped being a Christian was because uh, I I no longer could account for how there can be so much pain and suffering in the world if there's a God who's in charge of it. Uh, this, was a, this was more of a philosophical, theological question, and it's one that simply doesn't come up in my classes. Mm. Uh, and so I don't really—the uh, the straw that broke the camel's back for me was the problem of suffering. And I think students eventually grapple with that, but my, my goal is really to get them to think more critically about certain aspects of Christianity, which they can still, they can, they can do that and still remain Christian, although, of course, some of them do decide that they, they don't want to believe it anymore. Hmm. Well, listen, Bart, it's really been fascinating and, and quite an education to speak with you. Is, is there anything else you, you want to say? Is there any information you want to give to listeners as far as where they can reach you online. Obviously, I'll have a link to your book where I post this on my website. But do you, are you active on Twitter or anywhere else you want to point people? Yeah, I'll tell you, the, the most important spot is my blog, the Bart hmm. Ehrman blog. So it's E-H-R-M-A-N. And uh, people can go to that blog. Uh, I post five, six times a week, a thousand words a day. And people can join the blog and get everything. I, mean, I, I talk about everything, about Christianity in the first 400 years. So that would be the hmm. place to go. Great. Well, keep it up, Bart. You're uh, a one-man ministry in the right direction, and uh, <laughs> I really enjoy speaking with you. Great, Sam. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.